Hello. To those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting before, my name is Michael Reardon and I'm the college's archivist. Well, today I'm sitting, as I'm sure you'll instantly have recognised, in the most beautiful room in Oxford, the college's upper library. Well, this room dates to the 1690s and so comes up to just about halfway through the story of Queen's. But if we go right back to the beginning, to 1341, 680 years ago, we'll find that the college has maintained very strong links with the north of England from the very beginning. To my right, and several stories down, is the college archive, hidden away in what is technically called the Historic Collections and Archive Store, but is known colloquially to us all as the Vault. The archive contains a great range of material, right through from our 2,500 medieval deeds, through to account books, correspondence, and to fairly recent matriculation photographs. Amongst them are records that help shed light on the college's relationship with the North, and I want to share some of those with you today. Our founder, Robert de Egglesfield, was presumably from the village of Egglesfield, near Cockermouth in modern Cumbria, but then what was Cumberland. We don't know too much about him. He was a member of parliament for a few years, but was then ordained and became chaplain to Philip of Hainault, wife to Edward III. In 1341, he founded what's called on the foundation deed the Aule Scholarium Regine de Oxen, or the Hall of the Queen Scholars of Oxford. On 10th of February 1341, he issued statutes for his new college, which set out how it was to be organised and governed. But it also said what the college was to be for. And that was for the study of what Robert called the Tree of Theology, which meant that all of the fellows were already to have taken the BA and MA degree and were to devote their time in college to the study of theology. In Robert's original intention, there were to be no undergraduates. Egglesfield also stated that when electing fellows, preference was to be given to men from Cumberland and Westmoreland. Due to what he called the desolation and illiteracy of those two counties. His words, not mine. Preference is an inexact word, and it was put to the test 35 years after the foundation. In 1376, a dispute arose amongst factions of the fellows. The Archbishop of York, as visitor of the college, intervened. And by this document, he established a commission of lawyers to investigate and to settle the matter. It transpired that the dispute was between a group of fellows from Cumberland and Westmoreland and another group of fellows from the West Country who had migrated to Queen's from Exeter College. The case ended up in the Court of Chancery, where the statutes were interpreted in such a way that it was agreed that preference meant that all fellows had to come from Cumberland and Westmoreland. The West Country fellows were expelled from the college, but they stole several items when they left, including the college seal, in order to disrupt college business. It was another four years before the Sheriff of Oxford was able to retrieve them. But the longer legacy of the dispute is that for almost 500 years, every fellow of the college was a native of either Cumberland or Westmoreland, what became known as the Two Counties. This book is what we call the Entrance Book. It dates from the early 17th century and records the name of every student at the college from 1581, when it became law that every member of the university had to subscribe to the 39 Articles of the Church of England, until 1894. It also records the name of all of the fellows from 1341 till 1894, taking the names of the earliest fellows from the account rolls. This page lists everyone who was elected to a fellowship between 1680 and 1728. There are 76 names and every single one of them was born in Cumberland or Westmoreland. By then, a system had developed that although undergraduates came to the college from across the country, talented boys from the two counties were made tabardars. This gave them a small stipend which allowed them to study the MA and to stay in the college until a fellowship became vacant for them to take. A good example is George Fothergill, who entered the college from Westmoreland in 1722 and became a fellow in 1736. He was within a whisker of becoming provost in 1756, but his younger brother Thomas did become provost in 1767. 
George Fothergill is particularly interesting to us because we have about 60 of the letters he wrote home to his parents in Westmoreland in the 1720s and 1730s, and which reveal a lot of very interesting information about life in college at that time. They also remind us that until comparatively recently, Westmoreland was a very long way from Oxford. In 1742, George paid a trip back home to Westmoreland to see his parents in what might well have been just his first or second visit home in the 20 years since he had been in Oxford. And when he returned to Oxford, he wrote back to them describing the journey he had taken. In fact, it took a whole week for him to travel from Westmoreland back to Oxford, although admittedly he didn't travel on a Sunday, the day of rest. The great distance between the two counties and Oxford and the rarity of travelling back must have helped knit the fellowship together into a coherent group. This finally came to an end in 1858. 500 years after Robert Egglesfield had issued his Statutes for Queens, many people were beginning to question whether governing colleges in Oxford and Cambridge by statutes written centuries earlier was sensible. They looked towards colleges like Balliol or Oriel, whose statutes allowed them to elect fellows by competitive examination, which enabled them to elect the best men rather than those from a particular county or a particular school. In 1850, a parliamentary commission started investigating college statutes and the Fellows of Queen's cooperated. They drew up a new ordinance in 1858, rewriting the statutes for the first time in 517 years. This stated that Fellows were to be elected by open examination, and though the first of these, John Percival, a future President of Trinity and Bishop of Hereford, happened to be from Cambria, the second was not. Edward Moore was from Cardiff, and he was succeeded by J.R. McGrath, who hailed from Guernsey and would later become the college's provost for 52 years. The monopoly of Cumberland and Westmoreland on the college's fellowships was broken forever. Though the two counties had held a stranglehold on the fellowship, the college broadened out into a wider northern aspect in the 18th century. Robert Egglesfield's statutes had encouraged the provost to befriend the queens. But in the 1720s, Provost Joseph Smith set his sights a little lower and persuaded Lady Betty Hastings to make a significant contribution to the college. She was a northern lady, the daughter of the Earl of Huntingdon, though she lived in Bath and was known for her evangelical piety and charity. She was keen to establish scholarships for men from the north of England who would later become missionaries, but Provost Smith managed to persuade her to support men who would merely be ordained. She gave the college her manor of Welldale, and even in its sadly faded state, this map of 1769, 30 years after Lady Betty died, gives a good impression of what the college was getting. In fact, it proved even more profitable than expected when a rich seam of coal was discovered beneath the land in the 19th century. The land was sold by the college to the local council in 1967, who proceeded to build housing across it, and it now constitutes one of the suburbs of Castleford. The system laid down by Lady Betty for electing her scholars, though seeming somewhat bizarre today, reflects her character. She nominated 12 schools, eight from Yorkshire and two each from Cumberland and Westmoreland, who every five years could nominate a pupil who would then travel to the inn at Aberford, a town near Leeds. There they would be examined by a group of clergy who whittled their number down to 10. The provost and a small group of fellows then examined the remainder and reduced it to eight. These eight best pupils then had their names put into a pot and the first five names to be drawn out were elected Hastings scholars. Lady Betty observed in her codicil that drawing lots like this may be called by some superstitious, but she preferred to believe it as leaving something to providence. This page from the Hastings Register shows the system still in operation in 1839, over a century after Lady Betty's death. It continued until 1861. As we can see on this occasion in 1839, Sherborne School failed to find a suitable candidate to be put forward. Lady Betty's rules stated that if a school should be unable to find a suitable candidate four times in a row, that's a period of 20 years, then the school should be removed from the roster 
and another one elected in its place. One of those applying was Wheelwright Grammar School in Dewsbury. The headmaster, A.E. Holm, made the school's case, noting that most of the pupils could not afford to attend Oxford without a scholarship. The school was not successful, however, with Keswick School and Sheffield Grammar getting the available places. The Hastings scholarships broadened out a Cumbrian college into a more broadly northern college. I'm sure that many of you watching had a Hastings scholarship yourself, and many of you will remember the college as a predominantly northern college until very late in the last century. There is one more aspect of the college's connections with the north, and that is in its capacity as a landowner. Oddly, from its very first years, the college was a landowner in both the very south and the very north of the country. By royal gift, the college acquired an estate in Southampton through God's house, but our estate in the north came from the founder himself. Robert de Egglesfield had originally held land in Staines, what was then Middlesex and is now Surrey, but in 1328 he exchanged this for the village of Ravenwick. Now known as Rennick, it is a little to the northeast of Penrith and so is not far from his putative birthplace. In 1341, on founding the college, he gave his estate to his new institution. By this deed, he grants the college the Rennick estate, along with a house in Oxford, now part of the main college site. Much of the property in Rennick has been sold, but the college still owns a farm in the village and is lord of the manor. Note the seal with the three eagles, Egglesfield's personal seal, as well as the college's coat of arms but owning property at the country's extremities could be dangerous. The Southampton estate was damaged in the 1340s in a raid by the French, and the Cumbrian estate suffered problems in the early 15th century. A small estate in Bowness on Solway, to the northwest of Carlisle, had been acquired in 1416, but just three years later, the accounts for 1418 to 19 reveal that no income could be collected due to the devastation of the Scots. For most of its history, the Rennick estate has been run by the college as Lord of the Manor, in a system known as copyhold, which derives from the feudal system. Here the tenants held their land from the college, owing the college a rent. Tenants' title to their land was recorded as part of the records of the manorial court, over which the college presided. Tenants held a copy of this, hence copyhold. Thus, the records of the manorial court are title deeds, and because of an Act of Parliament dating to the abolition of the copyhold system in 1925, manorial records are the only records in the archive which the college has a duty under law to preserve from harm. Typically, each court appoints jurors, 12 tenants of the manor, then records any changes to tenancies before adjudicating on any breaches of the manorial customs by tenants or disputes between them. On this page, tenants are fined for digging up peat and burning lime. This is not evidence of mass law-breaking, but more akin to a system of licensing. Like the long rolls, the records of the manorial courts were originally preserved as rolls, but from 1675, the records of the court were kept in this book. We can see that the records were originally written on loose sheets of paper that were only bound together later. We come full circle with a gift from an old member, Percy Wyndham. He had come up to Queen's in 1886 as an Egglesfield scholar. It may well be that association which led him in 1895, not long after going down, to purchase Moreland Close Farm in Egglesfield, the Cumberland village from which the founder's family presumably originated. In his will of 1947, he left the farm to the college, thus given us another property associated with the founder. This document, formerly called a vesting assent, is the instrument by which the Midland Bank, Wyndham's executor, transferred the property to the college in accordance with his will. Thus, the college's connections with the north of England are still strong, at least in its capacity as a landowner. And though the northern character of college membership is not as strong as it once was, we are renewing these links through the college's outreach and access programmes, where we work with schools in Cumbria, Lancashire, Blackpool and Blackburn with Darwin to identify talented young people and to encourage them to join us in Oxford, though we no longer identify them by lot. 
We are proud of our connections with Cumbria and the North more widely, and the college is working hard to strengthen them for future generations of students.